All right, well, what's up everybody? Today I'm gonna to be talking about how pedigrees work in the form of a actual question on a test. And so this one, this question says, what sort of inheritance is shown by the pedigree below? And you know, we have a lot of different mechanisms of inheritance. But in parentheses you'll notice, I also said that you can assume that anyone who is brought in from the outside via a marriage is homozygous for the non-diseased alleles. And what do I mean by that? I mean like these, this man who's brought in, this person that's brought in, this person that's brought in, anyone who's brought in via from via the outside, you see how there's marriages and you don't really know their history. Anyone who's brought in, anyone with a red arrow right now is basically homozygous for the non-disease alleles. Whether that allele is dominant or recessive, we don't know right now, right? But I'm just saying they're homozygous. Secondly, before we even get into how this disease inheritance will work, there's other things we need to know for pedigrees. First of all, if it's a square, it's a male. We're talking about a male, all right? And if it's a circle, we're talking about a female, okay? Um, that's the biggest thing one needs to know because that thing is conserved through all pedigrees. This applies to all pedigrees, okay? So that's one thing that if you don't understand it, it's important to know because pedigrees can have different inheritance patterns for males and females. Um, and so... That is why we need to know what's male and female. Secondly, if you see a square that's shaded in versus a circle that's shaded in, that basically just means that the people who are shaded in are affected by the condition. Affected uh, by condition, right? So in this case, whatever disease is shown, this would this is a female that's affected, this is a male that's affected, this is a male that's affected, female, female, etc. So those are just some prerequisites to even understand what we're going to talk about. And now that we have the general uh, understanding of a pedigree down, now I want you to discuss the method. I want to discuss the method you're going to do to solve these sorts of problems. And the way you do is that you apply each answer choice to the pedigree, okay, to the pedigree. And the way you're going to do that is basically you're going to move down the list and, you know, our first answer choice was autosomal recessive. And we're going to basically apply and we're going to assume that this disease that we're talking about, like this disease that this woman has, it all is autosomal recessive. And then we're going to go down the list and we're going to see if it makes sense. Because if it works out, then the disease will be autosomal recessive. But if not, it probably isn't. So if it was autosomal recessive, and let's say this is a disease that's um, obviously diploid, then this woman would have to be lowercase a, lowercase a, right? Because autosomal recessive means that she has the disease. And that means that this male who does not have the disease can either be a, big A, big A, or big A, little a, right? But remember, I said in parentheses, you can assume that anyone who was brought in from the outside via a marriage is homozygous for the non-disease alleles. And in this case, homozygous for the non-disease alleles would mean the man has to be big A, big A. So assuming that's the case, is there any way that we would get out a diseased male and a diseased female from this mating? If we cross big A, big A with little a, little a, there is no way that you could, the only thing you'd get out of this is big A, little a, right? Because dad would donate the big A and mom would donate the little a. So you, all the offspring would be big A, little a, and they would, bo they would all be non-diseased, right? They would all be non-diseased. But what do we see here? Do we see that? Do we see the offspring are non-diseased? No, we actually see that the offspring have the disease, right? The offspring actually do have the disease, and so technically, autosomal recessive cannot be. So this clearly is not a good mechanism of inheritance. This cannot be autosomal recessive because if it was, we would not see the pattern we are seeing right now. So this disease cannot be autosomal recessive. So even though this disease can't be autosomal recessive, we can now investigate some other mechanisms of inheritance, which now include X-linked dominant. So X-linked dominant implies it's on the X chromosome. And this is where it gets a bit funky because this requires you to know that females have two X chromosomes and males have one X chromosome because males are XY and females are XX. But that's not gonna stop us. We can still understand how this inheritance pattern is gonna work. Because if we now look at this pedigree, we would have to assume this this entire mechanism is X-linked dominant. And if we assume that, then we shouldn't be able to make sense of this pedigree. And does that actually work? Does this pedigree actually make sense if we assume X-linked dominant? Well, no, it doesn't, because I want to call your attention to this part right here. This part where we have an unaffected female marrying an affected male. If this male is affected, then he has to have the disease. He has to have 
X big A Y, right? Because he has the disease. Similarly, this female is unaffected and she's also brought in by a marriage. So it's safe to assume that she's X, sorry, I zoomed in, let me zoom back out. X little a, X little a, right? If we assume that that's the cross, and now we, we actually cross them hypothetically, this hypothetical cross would then give us, right, X big A, Y, X A, no, not a, not a big A, little a, X little a, X little a, then this hypothetical cross is now going to literally, if we do it, sorry, if we do it, give us X big A, X little a, X big A, X little a, X little a Y, X little a Y. So what do we learn from this cross? We learn that all females, right? These are all females. All females would be affected, right? If this was X linked dominant and we had the hypothetical cross between these two, then the, the female progeny coming out of their cross should be affected. But is that what we see? Is this female affected? No. She is not affected. And therefore, X-linked dominant cannot be the mechanism of inheritance because her pedigree does not align with it. But let's move forward. What about X-linked recessive? Can this be an X-linked recessive disease? So now, we're going to do the same thing we did before, but instead of assuming this is dominant, we're going to assume it's recessive. So this female is affected. So that would mean she has to have two recessive copies because she has two X chromosomes. Similarly, this male is unaffected, and because this is X-linked recessive, we're going to assume he has X big A Y. Okay, and now let's do this hypothetical cross. If we do this hypothetical cross between these two, X big A Y, right, and then X little a, X little a, then when we do the cross, we find out that pretty much all females would be unaffected, right? Because they have one copy of the dominant allele. They have one copy, so they should not be affected. Similarly, all males would be affected. So in this cross, in this hypothetical cross, all females unaffected, right? Because they have one copy of the dominant allele, and they should be unaffected. But on the other hand, all males affected by the, by the disease. But is that what we see? Do we see males affected and females unaffected? Well, no, because we see a female that is affected there. So clearly, this does not follow our hypothetical assumption, and therefore X-linked recessive is incorrect. So therefore, that leaves us with our last answer, which is mitochondrial. So even if you didn't know it was mitochondrially inherited, you could have done a process of elimination and gotten D as the right answer. But I want to still explain that. I want to explain why this is mitochondrially inherited. Because I want you to know the biggest concept, at least for mitochondrial inheritance, and also just for the MCAT, um, mitochondria is maternally inherited. What do I mean by that? I mean that all of us, every single one of you, every single one of my family members, every single one of um, the people that exist on, on planet Earth, get all of their mitochondria from mom. Every one of our mitochondria comes from mom. And why is that? That's because, look at this, this is an egg cell, this is a sperm cell, and the fertilized egg is shown on the right-hand side of the arrow, okay? And the egg actually has all of the mitochondria, believe it or not. This sperm mitochondria, the mitochondria of the sperm, never make it into the overall fertilized egg. And the way I like to believe that this happens is because, look at this egg, the egg is just so much bigger than the sperm that everything that's in the egg eventually ends up in the zygote right? This is the zygote, by the way. A fertilized egg is also known as a zygote. But the point is, the mitochondria from the egg are the mitochondria that end up in the zygote. And what do I mean by mitochondrial inheritance? Well, mitochondria have their own DNA. And so if you have a mutation in that DNA, and your mom has that mutation, that mutation will get passed on through your generation back into the zygote, and therefore to you. So when I say that this mitochondria is inherited from your mom, let's assume this mitochondria is healthy and that the genome is healthy. Then the baby that's born will have healthy mitochondria because the mom had healthy mitochondria. We won't care at all about the dad's mitochondria. We only care about the mom. On the other hand, if the mom had a disease in a gene or a mutation in a gene, 
in the mitochondrial DNA, then when that mitochondria gets passed on, then the baby will have the disease and the mutation because the mom is the one that gives all of the mitochondria to the baby. So that's what I want you to know. Maternal inheritance is something that is tested on the MCAT and something that consistently tricks students every time. Why is that? Well, let me show you. Because this pedigree does not resemble anything you're usually used to seeing. You're used to seeing autosomal recessive, X-linked dominant, X-linked recessive, and I showed you that that, this doesn't, that that doesn't work. But what I want you to see is that maternal inheritance does work. Because look at this. This mom that I'm circling in the top corner of this pedigree is the one that has disease. She has diseased mitochondria, right? Because because she's affected. And now all of her kids, regardless of if they're male or female, will inherit her mitochondria. And therefore they will have diseased mitochondria, right? Does that make sense? So that's why both of these kids have the disease because their mom has the disease, okay? But now let's move on to a new generation. This second generation, notice I'm circling in like the left-hand corner of the pedigree. This, this female has healthy mitochondria, right? Because she's unaffected. Her mutation uh, and, and her condition is fine. And therefore, every single one of the kids that she has will have healthy mitochondria, even though she married the son of this mom that had it. But the son, remember, doesn't donate any mitochondria to the offspring. That's not going to happen. Only the mom does. And so that's all we care about. Similarly, this person... This daughter of the original mom that had the disease, this daughter that I'm going to label too, is affected. And so she's going to eventually get married and all of her kids will have the disease because she has diseased mitochondria. And if she has the diseased mitochondria, then that disease will get passed on to all of the kids and they'll have diseased mitochondria. So the point that I'm trying to make is this is a classic idea of maternal inheritance. This entire pedigree is going to be linked with maternal inheritance. So with that, as you'll see, this last generation substantiates that even further because this mom that I'm going to label three will then pass it on to all of her kids. So the point is... The, the mechanism of inheritance shown here is actually going to be mitochondrial. And with that, we've ended our video, done an insanely hard question, and hopefully learned a lot more about pedigrees in the process. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Give it a big thumbs up, subscribe, and see you in the next one.